You are listening to Next Up Nation, where leaders and influencers dish their secrets to inform, inspire, and entertain serious podcasters with host Tiffany Youngren. I'm Tiffany Youngren, owner of OMH Agency, and welcome to Next Up Nation, a weekly show for serious podcasters where you can hear leaders and influencers share their successes and challenges so you can level up your game. Thank you so much for listening. Today, I am so excited to welcome Ashley Chaney, founder and host at Dear Food Podcast. She is a Hollywood host and producer with nearly two decades in the business, which to see her. Like I would never guess that you've been able to even be old enough to be in the business for that long, but she has covered the Golden Globes, anchored Netflix news on Marina Menounos' network and has done live broadcasts with Ann Curry on TNT's Chasing the Cure. So lots of amazing people. As a producer, she's also worked with Lucasfilm, Paramount, Warner Brothers, NBC, MTV and National Geographic. Whether she's interviewing celebrities on the red carpet or guests on our podcast, getting people to open up and share their stories has always come naturally to Ashley. And I have to say, Ashley, I'm so excited to have you here, but I also skipped a bunch of parts about what a huge foodie you are. And I'm really excited to learn about your food podcast. Ashley, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm thrilled to be here. And the secret to the young skin is is, uh, Retin-A, folks, Retin-A. Oh, very good. (laughs) Very good. See, we are all about these handy tips. So yes. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you. That's it. That's your first takeaway for the show. So one of the things I know you shared with me a little bit before on the questionnaire that I give you ahead of time, things that people don't know about you. And one of them is that you cannot walk by a dog without petting it. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's true. I go on, um, you know, especially during quarantine and things like that. A lot of the activities that we could really do were just like walking around the neighborhood. I've dubbed the term boop walks. So I would go every dog that I would see, I would boop their nose. So it was like a a tally for how many dogs I could boop. I think the dogs are just magic for the soul and I'm dying to bring one into my own family, but not quite time yet. So you don't have one quite yet then, huh? No, I fostered for a really, really long time. And then just within, with the move and the place where I'm living right now, it's not really uh, ideal for a pup. I want to, I want like a horse sized dog. So oh, gotcha. I, not really the right <laughs> space right now, but once I move to a bigger spot, we'll, we'll look at getting Vent- a pupper in the family. That sounds awesome. Well, good, yeah. good. Well, and another thing that you mentioned was that you've done some pretty amazing interviews. What's one that just is memorable that you feel like? Like you'll just remember forever. Yeah. Okay. So there is, oh my gosh. And why is his name escaping me right now? Well, I'll, I'll, I know one for sure. There's two and hopefully his name will come back to me, but Drew Barrymore is a name I think that everybody knows and loves. My gosh, I grew up, you know, worshiping Drew Barrymore and just <laughs> loving her. Oh and gosh, I love uh, yeah, I, I got to interview her while I was supposed to interview her on this big red carpet for the show, Santa Clarita diet. Oh, yeah. um, have you heard of it? It's on Netflix. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> And so I watched you know, part the, of it one time. <laughs> I, I love Drew. Like I love it is. It is. I love her outfits on the show. I have to yeah. say. But so anyway, the the way a, a red carpet press line works, and forgive me if this is something that your listeners already know, but I'll quickly recap. All the press outlets line up behind a velvet rope on a press line, and it's categorized by like basically biggest, most reputable outlet to like smallest, more independent outlet at the back of the line. The idea being that the celebrity will stop at the bigger ones first. And then if there's no time, they'll just zoom past the smaller outlets. And I was with a medium sized network. I was with Marie Menounos' network. And uh, <laughs> the, this poor press agent comes running down, you know, Drew's late, don't ask her any questions. She doesn't have any time, just keep going. And I'm like, oh man, she was the one interview I really, really wanted to get tonight. And, uh, Sure enough, Drew comes down the press line, an angel that she is, I will say to her credit, she stopped at nearly every outlet, but time really was getting short and she hadn't come to ours yet. And I thought, okay, this is, this is just, this is my moment. So I shouted out a question to Drew. She had actually just launched a, and I knew this from doing my research, which is so important whenever you have an interview, as you probably well know, Tiffany, but she had just launched this, this makeup brand. And I shouted out a question, Hey Drew, I love your eyebrow gel. And then she was like, oh my God, she stopped on the red carpet. (laughs) She turned around, locked eyes with me and came right over to me and gave me an interview for the night, which I was oh. so excited about. Cause I knew that detail about her, yeah. you know, that other people hadn't researched. I don't think that, I think they were there to talk about the show and, but I knew that she had 
been working on this makeup project. So she was really excited to talk about it. And she's just like magical in person. So it was great. That was a fun interview. I'm so happy to hear that because she just seems like one of those people that you would just love meeting. And I think not to like skim over the fact, Ashley, that not only did you do your research, but you got her. You know what I mean? I always say you just really have to understand, look at them at like a human and what do they love? What do they care about? And then you did that. You not only researched, but you knew what's close to her right now. And probably knowing her, she probably in my world of not actually meeting her, but it seems like she gets really passionate about her projects. So that was a good call. She definitely does. I think that's one of the best ways, if I can just offer a tip, like right out of the gate to do that. If you find yourself in any kind of interview, whether you're interviewing for a job, whether you're interviewing a guest for your podcast, whether you're interviewing, I don't know, a prospective client, whatever. I think that social media really is a landmine for information. And that was in the case with Drew Barrymore, that was very simply like I had been following her social media. So I knew that she had posted about it and I knew it was something she cared about. It was right there for everybody to have, but people were looking at, you know, this press tip sheet for what's about Santa Clarita diet and things like that. So I just, I love to tell people to check out the social media account of whoever you're following. Well, and honestly too, don't you feel that when you have a guest that you really like and you really care about, it's easier even to connect because you know that like even yes we can research it which sometimes you know we makes us love them more but even if if you have guests and you're bringing them on just really kind of digging them already before they even get on your show i love that oh definitely yeah definitely loading up your belly with um things that can come that you can you know pivot around to in conversation i think it only helps you and obviously yes having an a genuine interest in the person you're talking to is pretty important <laughs> it helps so good good and it shows but so also and i, I i'm going to ask one more interview questions about someone that you've interviewed because i sure. feel we're going to move into talking more about that topic because it is such a big part of podcasting personally i think it's ideal i'm i think having solo episodes is great, but I think really guesting is my absolute favorite part of podcasting. You also had mentioned that you, did you interview Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Is that true? I sure did. Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm total yeah. fangirling over you right now. Like <laughs> two of my favorite people. That's so cool. Well, so the, and the, and the reason that that's so special, not just because Ruth Bader Ginsburg is obviously yeah. an incredibly inspiring human being, but also because the Supreme Court justice does not grant interviews to the media. It's a hard and fast rule. They don't do it. So the reason I was able to even have that opportunity is that, and here's another secret why I look so young. (laughs) I started in this business very, very young. So I went to a satellite program for mass communications um, starting in high school. So when I was 17, I was given this opportunity to, you know, write an essay and, and be one of 50 students that got to go to the Capitol and interview Justice Ginsburg. So the only way that would happen was as a student and not as a professional journalist. But so very, very uh, really, my first celebrity interview was when I was 17 and it was Justice Ginsburg. Well, and look at the table that it's at. That's so, that's so amazing. I love that. And I think too, you know, we, a lot of us have uh, teenage kids, adult kids, and I think really having them be, say yes to things, you know, don't be afraid to capture those moments because you never know, you know, what you're going to learn out of it, but also where it's going to take you down the road. Kids today, I mean, their (laughs) access to media and and their fear, I feel like they inspire me. I mean, I, I look at the generation younger than me. And I'm constantly in awe of their grit and their gumption and their like, just go out there and do it. I think what, what the generation below me does really well is uh, not, they are not perfectionists Mm. and it's so inspiring. And that's how I think some of these creators who are much, much younger than me are really cranking out content at a high pace because they're not so married to this perfectionism. So it's it's actually quite inspiring. I love that. Oh, I feel 1000% the same way. So I love that you said that. So, well, Ashley, why don't you share a little bit about what you're doing now? I know you have a podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about your podcast and then also how it fits into your vision as your professional life? Yeah, I'd love to. So the, the truth of the matter is all these companies that you mentioned at the top of the interview, when you were introducing me, I am so grateful for every experience that I had learning and working with those big companies, the Paramounts, the Lucasfilms, the the MTVs. Um, Those were an integral part of my professional development. However, about a year and a half ago, I was working on a film at Warner Brothers and it became so clear to me that it was just working in production in the way I was 
it wasn't people facing enough. It just wasn't lighting me up. In fact, it was really causing me quite a lot of stress. And I had to take an honest look in the mirror and go, okay, this is something that I know I can do. I know it's a skill I have. And I know it's uh, this thing that has provided for me financially for forever. And it's the sort of the safety net, to be honest with you. But I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew that it really was not feeding my soul. So the part of it that I really did enjoy was when I got to go out on the red carpets and talk to people, mostly because I love talking to people. So through those interviews on the red carpets, there was still even some of that, I don't really love this because I was always forced to talk about the movie that's coming out or the show that's coming out. And while those were really interesting, I found on the red carpet that when I got to talk about food. If ever an interview was, you know, not going as well as I wanted it to, or I wasn't researched enough and I didn't really know what to talk about, which is not a good position to be in. But if I ever found myself in that position, I could talk about food and watch the conversation change. I mean, mm. have you ever had that happen to you? If you don't know what to talk about some with someone, you can talk about food and it'll, it's like a pretty common denominator. A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was through that sort of revelation about a year and a half ago, I decided, okay, it's time for me to, to leave this job. Unfortunately, it's, it's really not the thing that does it for me. And then I have just sort of built a career as a freelance producer. So I will take on projects here and there that really excite me. I'm, I'm lucky to have that luxury to pick and choose projects. And I get to do voiceover. I do a lot of voiceover from home. I have a fun studio at home. And then the podcast is really the thing that is like, this is, this is it for me. This is the thing I want to talk about with as many people as possible. And I want to bring this conversation, these stories that really show us how much we have in common with each other. Mm. And I think honestly feed the soul. That's what I want to do. I want to be in that space. And uh, that's, that's it right now. Full-time voiceover and podcaster and some producing when the projects speak to me. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, I love that so much. So are you, how do you monetize? Like if this is your full-time gig, what is it that makes this something that can support you financially? Yes. So the truth is it's advertisement. So I have an advertising partner who pays based on CPM. For me, it's really about downloads and getting as many ears on the show as possible. And that's how it's able to pay for me. Obviously I'm, I'm, I'm newer. So my numbers aren't huge yet, yet. Um, and so that's where the other projects like voiceover has is something that helps support my bills because you got to pay the bills. And you're so really between, starting a business. Like it's building a business. Yeah. So you're treating it like that. You're how can 100%. I go over here and, and support it so that we can continue to build it. It's in the startup phase. I'm probably paying more to get it off the ground and, you know, investing mm-hmm. in more to get it off the ground than it's, than it's returning yet, but it's still early and that's okay. Well, how, now how long into it are you? I've been developing it for over a year. It's been, uh, I've had shows in the can for about four months and it's been on the air for a little over a month. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I thought I remembered seeing your numbers and they're still, they're, it's growing pretty strong already, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So would you say, I mean, you obviously are in an industry where you get a lot of attention, you know, you know, a lot of people, have you seen ways that an average entrepreneur maybe could monetize early using sponsorships? Or is that something that you really have to do some homework ahead of time to be able to squeeze into that? <laughs> Well, I think, listen, first and foremost, yes, you should be doing your homework ahead of time, period. (laughs) Always. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, That's everything from where can you find sponsorship opportunities to who do I align with? Mm -hmm. And I think that people have it in their mind that, oh, I can't have sponsors unless I have a super high download number, or I can't have sponsors unless I'm with a network or whatever. And that's really just not true. I think particularly for independent podcasters, it's really the time to be entrepreneurial. So let's say you have a a DIY podcast and you're all about crafting. I believe that going out to your local craft store who offers Thursday night workshops, probably virtually now, or maybe in, in person and saying, Hey, I have an upcoming podcast. I'd love to bring you on as a sponsor. If you get two to $500 for that one podcast, that's two to $500 that you wouldn't have had elsewhere. If you're sitting around waiting for your download numbers to, to, peak up. And there's also added benefits of potentially they share your name and your podcast with their newsletter and you get more listeners coming to you. So I think the shortest answer to your question is it's, it's never too soon to seek out sponsorships and to be entrepreneurial about it. There's also different platforms, which it's a little outside of my depth because I'm not with them, but I know, for example, Anchor allows you to have some uh, monetization options available. I won't speak to that because it's not my strength, but that's an option for sure for everybody. So 
Sure. Yeah, there are a lot of ways to do it. And it's true that people kind of get something stuck in their head that, oh, I heard this so that it's not, you know, it's impossible, but it really isn't. And I love your idea of partnering with similar industries, but different fields within that industry to create better content too, because it's more yeah. rounded, it's for the same audience, it's expanding outside it kind of makes it make more sense to bring in different content that you might not otherwise have brought in because you have this new voice that you're bringing in. You don't want to hurt the content in order to make money from your podcast. Exactly. A great question to ask yourself when you're seeking out sponsorships or just people that you want to partner with, whether there's a monetary exchange or not. And you and you might find yourself limited with who that person or, or company or, or et cetera, could be. If you ask yourself the question, what conversation do I want to be a part of? Mm. And where are those conversations happening? So, you know, my podcast is about food. Yes, we talk about food, but I'm not only talking to chefs or, you know, cooks or people professionally in the food industry, because that's not the point. The point is I want to talk with people who love food. So it's very people first, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and we get to drive the conversation about that. So tell me an example of someone you've had on your show that isn't, that might be unexpected that you would have on your show to talk about food. It would be unexpected. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is I, I had my grandfather on the show. He's, he's 91 years old and by no means media trained, like at all. <laughs> and, and in many, many ways, probably the worst, worst <laughs> guest. But actually what he did is he brought really genuine, authentic conversation to the podcast. And so Aww. I think if I were to just be looking for guests who had a huge following or who you know particularly fit into this niche, I wouldn't have had the opportunity for my 91-year-old grandfather to share our secret family popover recipe on the air. Oh, I yeah. love that. I love that. That is my, oh, that's such a sweet, that, that is sweet. I'm going to have to go back and listen to that one because I think that's amazing. And I yeah. have to ask, I don't know if this is even relevant, but I just have to ask, have you seen uh, Padma Lakshmi's Taste the Nation or have you? I haven't. I oh haven't. my gosh. Okay. Have, you haven't heard. It's on Hulu. It's amazing. That's why I and need to I, get up on Hulu. I'm yeah. up on Hulu. <laughs> and <laughs> honestly, I think Padma is amazing, but I just wouldn't watch a show just to be like, oh, Padma's on it. You know, like I watch yeah. Top Chef, so I get to see Padma. I'm good. But, and then people just kept talking about it and it's literally connecting the American culture together by food. And she goes to different regions. I mean, not that I want to do this commercial for the show, but it is awesome. And I know yeah. what you're sharing with me. I keep having flashes of like, oh, it's like when Padma was in New Orleans yesterday. You know? I have to and watch it. I'm with ashamed. Families. No, don't be, don't be. No, that's awesome. That's why I talk about food all the time because I do feel like it connects people. We all eat. And Absolutely. we all have different, you know, we eat different things and it, it, some of it's fast food and some of it's amazing. You know, well, I guess some people think fast food is amazing. <laughs> I should stop talking about that right now, but um, you know, we just all have our ways and our, and our, and culture does play a big part in it, even if we're far from our ancestors. <laughs> so it, I just think it's amazing. amazing what you can learn from somebody by talking about food. For example, on my show, every episode, I start with the same question, which I ask every guest with what's the first food you ever remember tasting? Oh, wow. And this really wonderful thing happens because the guests go back. They go way, 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 way back to childhood. And it's like just getting the, that little glimpse of what that food is paints mm -hmm. a whole picture of who this, where this person came from and what their worldview is. And it's, it's such a wonderful way to start off every interview. And, and I, mean, I encourage you to use that question <laughs> and conversation whenever you're stuck with someone because it, you'll be amazed with the answers that you, you hear uh -huh. and get to talk about afterwards. I love that. And even when you said that, it really puts this vision in my head that not only are they answering the question, but they're going back to that moment. Like you can exactly. almost see their eyes as that person when they were in that space. And mm -hmm. as an interviewer, the takeaway of this whole thing, I know we're just geeking out about food and talking about food right now, <laughs> but, but the takeaway really is if you're doing an interview and you have a moment where you can look at that person and mm -hmm. they just flash back to a moment, you feel it as an interviewer and it's pretty special and you get addicted yeah. and boom, you will always podcast because it is the greatest thing. <laughs> yeah. You really what's get that, to know what's that tug? Yeah. What's the tug yeah. that you can pull on, on the heartstring for your, your particular interview, your listener? Cause it's there. It's there for every conversation you have the opportunity to, to dig just a, just a touch deeper. Is there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh gosh. I love it. Okay. So how do you typically identify and find your guests? Do you have a strategy? Do you prospect for them? What is the way that you do that? 
my strategy is very targeted, hyper-targeted. What I recommend to anybody is, who do you know? Who's within your network already that you're friends with, that you could call, email, text, and say, I'm doing this show, would you wanna come on the show? And not just someone that is like your buddy, but someone that has similar passions or their, their goals and values are aligned. That's very easy to do with a topic on my show. So that's where I started. I started with the place that, okay, who are people that I know can have a good conversation with me that will bring you know, value and joy to our listeners. Okay, that's step one. That's like the easy part. Step two, I did. I went out and really mined social media looking for people who were in the food space. And this does mean some chefs, but it could also mean in the food space in terms of their food producers have this great cheesemonger that's going to be coming on the show and you know the stories that they can tell around cheese so looking for people that kind of fit that mold and then the next tier is moving to and this is a huge tip whatever your category is if you go on to amazon <laughs> books and see who's releasing a book that falls into your category there's a little filter that you can literally switch over that says releasing soon those people all want to talk about their book. So if you can find the marriage between somebody who is ripe and ready to talk about something and then do the little Venn diagram of how that intersects with your world and your topic, what you're covering, that's the perfect marriage for guest finding. And so- that just blew my mind. You get the trophy for the best tip of the day because that was awesome. That I hope was, it's helpful. Yeah. So remember, go to Amazon, search your topic, coming out soon. Who are those people? Yes. Love it. Love it. Yeah. And obviously there will be in most industries, there will be like some celebrity folks that are because the celebrity is always releasing a book somehow <laughs> every <laughs> week. And I think, you know, being a bit realistic about the possibility of reaching out to those people might be a little bit difficult, first of all, to find their contact information, but just keep going down the list. And there are people who are very easily accessible. Their contact information might even be listed on Amazon, but a couple of Google searches and you're in. I think that's brilliant too, just to be really strategic about the makeup of not only who the people are, but having content that's well-rounded and makes sense. I always say like, I selfishly know who I want on my show, but then it's always a matter of making sure that the show itself is well-rounded and yeah. hitting all the marks. So I think that's yeah. really a good approach. And, and I just also want to say that it's okay in my eyes, it's okay to find the connection between your two worlds. If it's not super obvious, I don't mean forcing a square peg in a round hole, but I do mean like if it, if it, if it seems like something that, oh, it's not a very obvious fit, that doesn't mean that there's not a really great angle in there. And I think it's your job as a podcast producer or host to find the connection. And again, not forcing something that's totally an unnatural fit, but there's more often than not a link there that you just have to kind of craft. And then that, that in your pitch is, is what you highlight. Yeah, I love it. And then again, circle back to what they care about and that you've noticed them. I know that that works a lot. You know, if you can get the contact information for anyone on your dream list, still yeah. send it and can, and just throw that connection out, something that you know that they care about and lift them up somehow because it goes a long ways for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you're, these are humans after all. So <laughs> showing some human, you know, connection and Hey, I listened to your latest podcast and I loved this piece showing mm -hmm. that you really listened or, Hey, I read your latest book and it blew my mind or whatever. That's your currency. Yeah, exactly. Have you heard of Neil Patel? Yes. Okay. So the first podcast that I did was called Chat and Grow. And I just did it because I loved it. I love marketing. And I like small business and I like businesses and entrepreneurs. So I was like, oh, I'm going to start a podcast. So I did. And I loved it. Of course, it wasn't part of the services that we offered at the time or anything. I just, it was my indulgence. And yeah. um, I, I just love Neil Patel, like everything that he puts out. And one day I just got an email from him. I was at an airport somewhere and my assistant had just said, you know, you really should get him on your show because you are obsessed. Like you just think he, everything he says is perfect. And I was like, okay. So I literally replied to one of his newsletters. I just said, right? you know what? I read everything. You're brilliant. My assistant just told me that because I'm so obsessed, I should just ask you. And I got a reply from him CC'd to his assistant saying, set it up. Done. And so again, awesome. it's like, if it's authentic, you have a much better chance. It's not always going to get seen. Like they all get a million requests, but yeah. it might be. And um, so I just, I always want to encourage people, just ask. The worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to say, don't stalk me. The next worst <laughs> thing is that they're going to say no, or they're not going to say anything. And that's the right. most likely. <laughs> so, but then yeah. the coolest thing is, is you get the interview. So absolutely. Yeah. And what you actually sort of touched on there is really important too. A lot of people I've heard as a, as a, an 
an excuse, I'm going to say that with some kid gloves, but an excuse is how do I reach out to these people? Well, you're exactly right. Usually there's a newsletter coming to your inbox every week or whatever. So you have a newsletter connection right then and there. You're living proof that you can reply to that. I just did that strategy last week. So <laughs> fingers crossed. Good. Okay, good. <laughs> um, yeah. And then social media. I mean, I have gotten tons tons of response from going to someone's Instagram and writing a, a leading with what I can offer these people. That's really important. Whenever you're reaching out to someone leading with the benefit to them and shooting off a message via Instagram. I mean, I think I'm like at a 75% response wow. rate on, on Instagram. It's really, really high. And then, like you said, the worst case is that someone doesn't respond. Yeah, no exactly. So yeah. who's on your dream list? Like who's someone oh my gosh. that you <laughs> I have so many, um, but like the dream right now is, is Chrissy Teigen because she's, Ooh. she's like this. She represents all the things I love. She's this huge, obviously foodie. She has a cookware line. She has cookbooks that I love and use in my home all the time. And she's obviously in the Hollywood world as well. So I just, I'm trying to manifest <laughs> that. I want her to come. It's totally going to happen. It's totally going to yeah. happen. Oh, I love that. So I, I know I always have my dream list too. And um, who's your dream list? Well, I would say I have about 10, but I really want to talk to Ryan Serhant and I want it to be live. And I know it's just so obscure. I mean, Jay Abraham too. I think, I don't know if you know who he is, but he also is on my dream list. But Ryan Serhant is on, I mean, I first discovered him on, I'm such a reality show junkie, but he is on Million Dollar Listing New York. Oh, okay. okay. And then he had a show called Sell It Like Serhant. And then he wrote a book called Sell It Like Serhant. And uh, I just love how he helps people do something that seems so difficult. That's got a stigma about having to be a person that you're not. And he just yeah. breathes it into him. And I love that his sales team do uh, improv every Monday. Oh, like that's part fun. of his sales training for his team. So I just, I love his approach mm. to like, and he's super funny too. So um, yeah, so he's definitely, you can get list, him. So yeah, you can definitely get him. Totally. Well, I made it to his assistant. I used to have a real, he's in real estate and mm -hmm. I had a real estate podcast. And I know for a fact, because I've listened to his book like five times, I know that if I just called him every day, I'd get it. But now <laughs> I'm, I, I'm actually happier that I'll have him on this show than the last show. So I'm super excited. It all excited. works out. Oh, I'm it excited does. for you. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to hear Chrissy Teigen on this. You tag me or something and I'll make sure that I share oh, yeah. it with everybody. Cause that'll be a moment. It'll be a, it'll be a champagne moment really. So <laughs> Um, Champagne, on, caviar, the whole nine. Yes. <laughs> well, I'll be <laughs> celebrating together. So why don't you share with us the name of your show and where people can find you? Yeah. So the show is called Dear Food and it's available pretty much wherever you get your podcast, um, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify. You can ask Alexa to play the podcast. Um, <laughs> Love it. So yeah, Dear Food and stories uh, about the foods that have shaped our lives. Okay. And then two, is there a next step with your show? I, As a podcaster, mm -hmm. I'm always looking at as we're sharing things, I mean, people fall in love with you and then they're like, oh my gosh, I love that you always want to talk about food. What's the next step for people if they're like, Ashley, I love what you're about. How can I learn more about what you're doing and how to connect? Yeah. So the first step is just, we have a Facebook group. It's a, it's very small and intimate and it's to really unite food lovers. It's called Here for the Food um, okay. on Facebook. And we, it's a group of just passionate people food lovers. So, so we're always posting pictures of food and what we're making and asking for recipes and stuff like that. So it's a wonderful community for food lovers to be a part of, or if you just want inspiration or to drool or, or what have you. <laughs> what and then, a, safe, a safe place for food pictures. Okay. I'm uh, yeah. all over this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's no judgment. I, I think that sometimes I really do think that the food world can be just a touch intimidating, particularly once you get into the like foodie kind of bougie scene. Um, <laughs> this group is not that in fact, we even have a thread called Ugly Delicious where it's just like this, <laughs> things are ugly, but taste delicious. So that's like the first step for just really becoming part of the community. And then as our show grows, we are going to be offering, and once the world opens up again, um, some excursions, some Ooh. sort of food and travel destination sort of getaways, those kinds of things. And in the distant, not so distant future, there will eventually be a cookbook. Uh, every episode, somebody usually shares a recipe. So we're compiling oh. those recipes into a cookbook. So. Oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah. Well, awesome. And um, what is something that I haven't asked that maybe I should have? Is there anything else that you'd like to share? Something that you haven't asked? Well, you're doing such a good job. So Aww, I can't really say that there's so anything that you should have asked. I mean, what else I would like to share is just, I think podcasting has become this really incredible love in my life. And I think I don't know if this is really a question or not, but if it's just a, a piece of encouragement to your listeners out there, in light of world events, I, I want to express so wholeheartedly that we are 
all on the same playing field in a way that we've never been before. So I'm uniquely entrenched in the Hollywood world and I have been, and that's, and that's my world. But for the first time ever, those barriers have been kicked down and knocked over and we are all presented the exact same opportunity to get our shows out there and to be heard and to be seen. And I just think it's a really exciting time for anybody who is about to put anything out there into the world, whether it's your online class or your workshop or your podcast. I think it's an incredible uh, moment in time to do that. Mm, so. I love that. We're all wearing sweatpants, right? I mean, I'm not, but often we are. <laughs> I <laughs> yeah. am. These are I yoga pants on the bottom it. down here. <laughs> I have yoga pants on. Now, wait, that counts as sweats. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I don't have shorts on today, so there's that, but yeah, yeah. Hey, I pants, wonder like half pants count. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I love it. I love it. Okay. So I have a question that I ask everybody at the end of my show. And I really, I always say, I think it's one of the most important questions that I ask. And I don't think I've had a guest that I've been more excited to ask this of. Oh boy. I love good food. Mm. What is your favorite restaurant and what do you order when you go there? Can I tell you my real, real favorite restaurant? Yes, please. Even though it's not in the United States? Yes. Okay. So it's this crepe place in Paris. Oh. And I wanted to hate Paris. I went okay. to, I had a business trip last October to Marseille, France. And we spent, you know, we had almost the entirety of the trip was in Marseille. But my boyfriend convinced me. He was like, we are going to Paris. I'm not a big city person. I really don't like city life. I thought... <laughs> Paris is not for me. We got to Paris. We had 24 hours before our plane took off. And, you know, foodie me, I'm like, well, we're going to make this a culinary 24 hours in Paris. Right. And the first place we went to, we started off at this crepe shop. I think it's called like the creperie. <laughs> and I had a crepe that I can still taste. It is one of one of three meals, I think, in my whole life that made me cry when I ate it. Oh my God. So I'll just paint the picture for you. I'm sitting on a side street. Everything is al fresco in Paris. You know, we're, so we're sitting outside in what looks like a Disney set. I can't believe it's even real life. <laughs> and the waiter comes over and, and I order this. It was a um, creme brulee crepe with uh, whipped cream on top and toasted uh. almonds. And when I took a bite of that crepe, um, I, it was one, it was a moment where I had to push my plate away, like stop, collect myself. It was the best piece of food that's ever entered my mouth. So uh, truly, if I could say that was my favorite rush, it's, it's that place. I mean, that's okay. where I'd want to be again okay. in a minute. I love it. I love that whole picture that you've just painted and not to sway from that at all. Can you give me an LA tip of a restaurant? I know. <laughs> LA, I know. Yes. Okay. I love your so, story. And I'm glad that that was the first one that we so talked about. And now I need, now we're, now we're brass tacks. Like I go to LA tacks. a lot. I need, okay restaurant favorite dish. When you're next in LA, next time you're in LA, you absolutely must go to Osteria La Buca. It's on Melrose Avenue. It's right across from the Paramount Studios. Okay. And it's one of the small, there's Osteria Mozza, which is like the famous place to get pizza. There's always a line down the block and it's really good pizza. But if you just go a few blocks down the road to Osteria La Buca, they home make their pasta in-house every day. It is to die for. But the thing on the menu that you have to, have to, have to get, and it's going to sound crazy, they're Brussels sprouts. They're oh my Brussels gosh. sprouts. Are, and they are to die for. I mean, they oh. are to die for. So they, they, they roast their Brussels sprouts in a wood pizza oven. So they get really, really crispy. They put some sort of creamy sauce on top and there's an egg on top too. Oh my it, gosh. You have not lived until you've had those Brussels sprouts <laughs> if you're in LA. They are so okay. good. Well, stereo awesome. la buca, get the Brussels sprouts. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll actually be there very soon. So we will oh, have to yay. try that out. So yes, please <laughs> let me know how you like them. Yes, I definitely will. Well, Ashley, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Oh, it was such a pleasure to be here and great to talk with you about all things food and, and marketing and podcasting. Yes. Best. I have to say, this has been the hardest one to keep on time. I think I've ever done. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm like, Ooh, so let's talk about food some more, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but no, 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 no. We're good. We're good. I absolutely loved your tips on how to get anyone to talk to you, how to look on Amazon for authors who are looking for opportunities, just like someone's podcast who's sitting out there going, I want a really great guest who wants to talk about this yes. topic, puts all the control in your lap. So I love it. Thank you so much to everyone for listening. And thanks to our outstanding team. And remember the best really is yet to come.